Good morning, everybody. I may have mentioned this before on this channel, but I actually really enjoy playing spellcasters. Pretty much every variety. Sorcerer is super fun. Favorite Soul's got some damage and healing, same with Cleric. Bard has the cool versatility of the way the different spell songs interact and how you can get your cool songs to buff people, give them additional mana cost reduction, regenerate their health, regenerate their spell points. Artificers at Rune Arms, which is just super cool. And even wizards can turn undead. But there's one other spellcaster out there, and its name is Druid. Now, if you've watched my previous content about Spellcaster Druid, which you can find just in the corner there right now, you'd know that I actually really don't like Spellcaster Druid. There's just something off about it, and it's hard exactly to describe. You see, the Druid has a special spellcasting mechanic called the Season Mechanic. In the early levels of playing as a Druid, you're encouraged to use your two different seasons, the Summer Season for all of your Fire and Force and Light spells, and the Winter Season for your Cold and your Lightning spells. Swapping between the seasons is absolutely no cost. However, doing so has a great benefit, giving you bonus caster levels, which just increases your damage by a dramatic amount in the early game, as well as giving you some extra spell power. Being a 4th level druid and going from caster level 4 to caster level 6 by being in the right season is a 50% damage increase, and it's pretty impactful. And this stays throughout the entire time you play as a druid. However, there are a couple issues that arise along with this. Changing season isn't too bad whenever you cast a spell, since you only have a few spells to cast. Produce flame, call lightning, creeping cold, the basic stuff. But as you increase in level, you get more and more spells you want to weave into your rotation. Flame Strike, Firestorm, Word of Balance, Greater Creeping Cold, and eventually you get your elemental forms, allowing you to cast Body of the Sun or Ice Flowers, different spells that specifically require the elemental forms and while being very powerful, again, require you to be in that either season or specific elemental form. The benefit is that being in the right form, as I said before, gives you a tremendous amount of extra power. The downside is that since each elemental form actually requires you to sometimes be in the form to cast, or since the elemental form actually reduces your caster levels of spells in the other form, such as fire spells getting reduced caster level while in water elemental form, now if you make a mistake, you actually really feel it. Your damage is a lot lower than it would normally be. On top of this, druids are kind of weird in that they don't really get a lot of area of effect spells in the early game. Pretty much every single spell that they cast is single target, and it isn't until 7th level when they get to pick up flame strike to do some area of effect damage. Flame strike is a fun spell, but it has a bit of a slow casting animation and can be quite cumbersome. So what happens when you take all of this together? You have a character class where you have cool spell casting, but it requires you to change seasons or change your stance to make sure you're casting spells at the right way to be able to do additional extra damage. Almost all of your spells are single target, and as a result of most of your spells being single target, if you can't kill a monster in one spell, you're going to be changing stance possibly more than one time per monster that you're facing, and if you have to face down 10 monsters, it's going to take you a while to chip them down until you get a good area of effect spell. And even when you have that area of effect spell, oftentimes it's not going to land unless you're in full control of the group. If you're the first person into a room, then the monsters will play follow the leader with you and will follow you exactly where you want them to go, making sure that you can get every single monster landing in your big fire pillar from the sky. But when you play with others, they're going to move in places that you might not otherwise expect. And on top of that, since most of your spells are single target, if you start to launch a single target spell at another enemy, your projectiles may not have a chance to connect if someone else kills those monsters. And because they're all single target, there's no splash over damage. If a sorcerer whiffs on their fireball, the fireball hits the ground and still damages all the nearby monsters. But when your produced flame hits the already dead monster, nothing happens. All of these different factors have come together for me to kind of solidify that I'm not a big fan of Caster Druid. However, I will be very transparent and say that I tried my hardest to play this character in Reaper mode. Early Reapers felt great since getting access to a whole bunch of spell-like abilities means that Reapers basically instantly die. Oh, a Reaper spawned into my Harbor quest? Well, guess what? Maximized, empowered, quickened, call lightning, and it's gone. It doesn't even matter if it makes a save, it just takes that much damage. So there definitely were some good aspects to it. However, a lot of the area of effect really doesn't come online until later. Now, this isn't to say that you always need area of effect damage, but consider the difference between having a single target melee attack and a single target spell cast. As I said before, if you happen to be targeting as a monster and you throw a produce flame at a skeleton that is standing next to another skeleton, if the skeleton that I'm attacking dies before the produce flame reaches it, the produce flame will not continue past the skeleton and hit the one that's possibly standing behind it. Instead, the produce flame will stop in its tracks and do nothing. Similarly, if you decide to use call lightning, 
same problem. If the lightning strike doesn't come down fast enough and someone else kills the monster, your lightning strike is not going to hit the monster that's next to it. However, in the case of different types of projectiles, such as physical projectiles, like using a bow and arrow or something, or melee attacks, which just happen to keep going if there's no monster there, if you swing at the skeleton and the skeleton is already dead, the next skeleton that's right next to it will be in range of your melee attack and will take the damage. I found that quite often during the leveling process, due to the single nature targeting of a lot of my spells, playing in a group felt kind of tiring sometimes because the frequency at which your spells just don't land when you're not the first person in the room definitely started to grate on my senses, especially when you want to use slow casting spells like Firestorm or Wall, Wall of Fire and Flame Strike to try to deal damage to monsters. Getting to level 13, picking up Firestorm, picking up Fire Elemental Form, it definitely helped out a lot and made my character feel a lot better in the area of effect sense. Firestorm has an absolutely massive AoE, so it's very difficult to miss, and the spell casting speed was increased, making it a pretty good spell for this character. But running into the same problem of missing some of my spells and running out of spell points maybe a little bit faster than I should, it definitely felt tiring. To top it off, while playing, I decided to consult some other druids. I had lots of people pop in chat who have a lot more experience with druid than I did. In fact, if I'm ever playing a character build and you have experience with something, you should definitely check out twitch.tv slash to see what character builds we have cooking here and to maybe help share your knowledge of the game that I might be missing. Because while I do play this game a lot, I don't get to try out every single character playstyle, so it's helpful here to learn. Some of the people that taught me about druid said that the important thing is managing some of the druid area of effect spells. Ice Storm. Wall of Fire, Storm of Vengeance. These spells deal a lot of damage over time, especially if you get the monsters in the area. And what I found was, that's actually true. Using these spells is really, really useful, especially against bosses. However, there are a ton of caveats and issues with this idea. The first problem is that especially Ice Storm takes nearly four seconds to come online, from cast to damage, it's a long time before you actually see anything coming out. Now this isn't too big of a deal if you're playing by yourself, but if you're playing with others, that gives somebody the ample time to use a cleave or a single fireball and get aggro on every single monster in a pack. And you can't control other players and where they're planning to go. In fact, on screen, you're going to see right now a scene where I dropped out all of my area of effect, but because it takes time for the area of effect to actually go out, the person who had aggro on the boss simply just didn't take them into the area of effect. I can't blame the other person, it's not their responsibility to actually use the area of effect in the room, and I tried my best to place it, but now things were on cooldown. And this is a common problem I had with Druid. Slow, lots of waiting, lots of single target. It just didn't feel as fluid and fast as some of the other classes. Now, this isn't a bad thing about Druid. I'm not saying that the character class doesn't work. It actually works really well. Great healing, great sustain. I just found for me, it wasn't in my play style. I'm not a very patient person when I play. I like to go into the room, hit the monsters, move to the next room. Druid isn't like that. Druid is go into the room, gather up the monsters into an area, throw down your ice storm, cast a regenerate on yourself, maybe cast another spell to help out, wait a little bit, and then move into the next room. Planning, preparedness, that's druid caster in a nutshell. To make this easier on myself, I could have dropped it out of reaper difficulty. Dropping it back down to elite, especially starting around level 11 or 12, would have helped out a lot. For those of you that don't know, monsters in reaper difficulty get a plus 4 bonus to all of their saves against spells. This was added in a patch about a year ago, maybe it was more than a year ago, I don't know. But this makes it so spell catchers have a slightly harder time when fighting against monsters, especially in reaper mode. As a result of this, since pretty much every single one of your spells is an evocation spell of the reflex save variety, Monsters with Evasion really put a damper on your day. Druids not having a great amount of spell points to be able to overcome this by just throwing repeated spells and having few sources of extra DCs to really make their spells powerful and hit hard, since the tree really only gives plus one, it's a hard sell for me to say that you should play Druid on your first life character all the way through Reaper mode. Definitely, once you start getting into level 11 and 12 quests, bumping down to elite difficulty. If I'm being totally honest, I think that right now, if you're playing Druid with past lives, some gear set up, your character is going to fly through. But without having things that bump up your DCs, you'll struggle a lot like I did. There were definitely some quests, specifically around Sharn, where instead of actually attacking the monsters, I kind of just supported the people that I was with, because as a druid, I'm excellent at doing that with a lot of my area of effect heal over time spells, and it was better than spending a bunch of mana on a firestorm to watch the word save show up and seeing every single monster in the room taking no damage since Sharn just happens to have pretty much every monster with evasion. So I don't want to discourage you from liking Spellcaster Druid. It's definitely improved over where it was before. And honestly, I think a lot of the damage is super duper high. As far as moving into epics, while I don't think that Spellcaster Druid is going to overtake any of the current endgame spellcasters like Alchemist or Sorcerer, I do think it's going to have a good place. And with improved actual damage spells, combining that with having a good earthquake, I think that Druid can now make a reasonable contender and will feel very fluid to play 
play in the end game. I just personally didn't like it as much for my play style, but that doesn't mean it won't work well for yours. A lot of people really love Druid, and if you want more resources about Druid, I'm going to link you to Voodoo Spice, who has several different materials about this. Very smart guy, knows his stuff about Druid. I'll link some stuff in the description so it's easy to find. So if you want to explore a little bit more about Druid, I encourage you to read up on some of those materials. Now, if you're watching this video the day that it is coming out, I just want to let you know that I am in fact doing an event tonight with Linabel from Standing Stone Games. The two of us are going to be taking your ideas that I've been posting about in the YouTube community page for this channel about which enhancement trees you guys would like to see us take a look at and create. And so we're going to be doing that tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday, March 22nd. So please tune in and check it out if you're interested. Again, this is the day of watching. If this is not the day, if you're not watching this on March 22nd, I'm so sorry. But I'll cheer you up by letting you in on exactly how I built this character. Spellcaster Druid can be very fun. And I'd like to show you how you can have very fun with a Spellcaster Druid. By bringing you my character, Beardform Baruch Kazad, my Dwarven Druid. Now this character served me well from level 1 all the way up to level 20. And by served me well, I mean it performed the worst out of all of the different spellcasters that I played. Now I would like to point out and make sure this is exceedingly clear. Uh, I am not a very good Druid player, so that has a lot to do with it. But my personal experience coming in together, it did have a lot going for it. Specifically, a lot of its defensive stats being higher than some of the other spellcaster classes, partially for being a dwarf here. Druids only need wisdom and constitution for the most part for their base stats, so we started with a constitution of 20 and a wisdom of 18 and left everything else at their base value, which didn't really hinder me that much. It also allowed me to have pretty good fortitude and will saving throws, with reflex being a little bit far behind, so you just gotta make sure you make that up with items. As far as what skills I ended up using, because I had a minus on my intelligence, I couldn't take too many. So I took Spot, Spellcraft, and Heal. Heal is for all your healing spells. Spellcraft is for all your other spells. And then Spot was just nice to see invisible creatures. Now, as far as the feats go, I took, like, all the metamagic feats. Um, I didn't take Heighten on this character. I didn't feel like Heighten was going to be too valuable for this character during the leveling process. Although I definitely recommend you would take Heighten on this character. Specifically, either maybe at like 24 or something like that. Because you have so many spell-like abilities. And a lot of lower level spells that you do end up casting on this character. Although it's important to note that if you have enough transmutation DCs, you can instead just purely focus in on Ice Flowers. Since Ice Flowers has almost zero cooldown and can be spammed repeatedly as one of your spells. So I started out by taking Maximize, Quicken, and Empower, so at 1, 3, and 6. And then once I had those spells down, I realized I needed more spell points, so I took Mental Toughness and improved Mental Toughness, and then after that I grabbed Spell Focus, Evocation, and Transmutation. Those feats allowed me to actually get enough DCs and also some more mana so I could cast some spells. Now, another important note is the actual uh, animal form feats, the wild shape abilities. Uh, I started out by taking Fire Elemental Form at 13. This is a good idea because this gave me access to Firestorm with Fire Elemental Form at 13, giving me a lot of really good area of effect burst damage, so keep that in mind. Then when it comes to the second wild shape, Water Elemental, I took that at 17, which at the, by that point you'll have Ice Flowers and it starts to feel pretty good. The actual animal forms don't really matter too much. You can pop into Winter Wolf if you want to get access to the Cold Breath Winter Wolf ability. Honestly, I didn't find it being too important, so it doesn't really matter to me. As far as the spells go, um, as you can see, I do have some spaces down here. The, the higher end spells, there aren't a lot of them that you actually need. In fact... Um, you can't actually use all of the spells on this list. You don't need to cast Mantle of the Icy Soul or Anger of the Noonday Stun. These are spells that let you bypass all immunities of fire or ice, respectively, depending on your elemental form. However, uh, there's an ability later on that you get that makes these apply automatically. Uh, you can't cast Snow Slide because you're not in Winter or Druid form, or like Winter Wolf. So you just have the Summon Nature's Ally, Regenerate Mass, and Storm of Vengeance, and the other spell slots don't even matter, which is kind of funny. Ah, good old Druid. Anyway, as far as the important spells, make sure you're taking the updated DPS spells. Specifically, Produce Flame, uh, Creeping Cold is a good one. Uh, Salt Ray did a, does a lot of damage and really carried itself throughout. Mostly off, based off of the spell-like ability more than anything else, but still it was nice to have throughout the entire process. Also getting access to Call Lightning. Flame Strike was actually very, very good when I got this at level 7. It's a little pricey, costing 20 base, but it was pretty good. I liked it, and uh, it worked out really well for the early leveling process. On top of that, Call Lightning Storm now scales off of the Call Lightning damage, which is really valuable because the way that I worked it is I actually had a Call Lightning Storm on my action bar that was using specifically uh, Maximize and Power and all that stuff ahead of time, so I could just 
past this spell called Lightning Storm. It lasts for like a minute, and for the entire minute, it has maximized and power, and it's doing a whole bunch of damage to people. Uh, like it's a free lightning or call lightning cast, which is pretty cool. Uh, the six level spells, the only one that matters is Greater Creeping Cold. Uh, you do actually get access to the Word of Balance spell as well as the spell like ability, but I found for the most part I was only casting the spell like ability and not the spell too often. Uh, for level 7, that's when you get Regenerate, Firestorm, Body of the Sun, Freezing Spray. Freezing Spray is great for bosses. It makes them take more damage from cold. So if you're playing as a cold, uh, you know, what do you call them, uh, Druid, you want to make sure you have this at all times. And then Firestorm is just like your bread and butter fire spell. The AoE on this is amazingly big. And so swapping between fire and cold and going Water Elemental, Ice Flowers. Back to Fire Elemental, Firestorm. Back to Water Elemental, Ice Flowers is a great way to get lots of free damage onto people. And then Body of the Sun is just nice to have. Uh, Storm of Vengeance does a lot of damage. And in fact, one of the big damage combos I would use when I got to bosses was Maximized Empowered uh, Quickened Storm of Vengeance plus Maximized Empowered Quickened Ice Storm in one place. Plus I had the Maximized Empowered Quickened Call Lightning Storm on myself. So monsters, when the boss spawns or is ready to fight, they're already just starting off taking like 4,000 damage in Heroics. And then they just get chunked down by the rest of my spells, which is pretty convenient. As far as the enhancement tree went, this is kind of how I had it set up for now. I don't think that this is the best way to go about it, but uh, Druid is one of the classes that can benefit the most from Fade Dark, Fade Dark Illusionist tree, so if you have extra points, it's not too bad to spend in here. Um, specifically, out of Season's Herald, you want to grab all of the spell-like abilities during the leveling process. Without these spell-like abilities, I think that Druid uh, is kind of bad, and by kind of bad, I mean really bad during the leveling process. All their spells are single target, so you would run out of spell points really quickly. However, thanks to the spell-like abilities, you can kind of spam these the entire time, uh, which makes the leveling process a little bit easier. I am of the mind that once you get into epics, and especially if you're in your proper destinies, you probably don't need these anymore. So what I would likely do moving into epics is take the 15 points out of these spell-like abilities uh, and instead uh, start taking some other stuff in the tree, maybe the improved meta magic to make some stuff cheaper, or just saving points because you have 46 in here in the tree. So take like nine points here and then not spend the rest of them anywhere else and start finding them in other, other trees or something like that. Uh, a couple notes that I want to talk about that I think are really important here is number one, your seasons. This character is all about changing season. While you're in the summer stance, you gain uh, fire, light, sonic, force, and positive spell power. And all of those spells are more powerful. They get higher caster levels and maximum caster levels. Same thing with Elder of Winter. It's for your water, earth, acid, and electric spells. So you will be swapping between these two seasons. These are actually buttons that are on the on your in, like track that you can press. So you would swap into Child of Summer, cast some spells, press the other button. There's no cooldown. There's no animation for these abilities. You can just swap whenever you feel like it, which makes it very convenient. Once you get into the rhythm, uh, it starts to get a bit better. But again, it's all about practice. I think this is a very high practice character. Later on, when you pick up the elemental form, the elemental forms replace these because when you're in an element, fire elemental form, you are automatically counted as being in uh, the Child of Summer. And same thing with Elder of Winter. You're automatically counted this when you're in water elemental form. Up here, Elemental Mastery also gives you the effect of the Noonday Sun, so Fire Penetration, or Water, or sorry, uh, Cold Penetration while you're in Water Elemental form. So you don't actually need to take those spells, you just change form to get that uh, when you're doing that here. So it's kind of cool, you want to make sure you're in the right form. The big difference is like, consider that right now, it's only at 30 extra, or sorry, 45 extra spell power being in one being in one stance to the next, which is pretty good. But it's also, that's where you get your crit from Wax and Wane. So you get 8% additional crit chance. So if I'm in Summer and I cast a Fire spell, uh, I'm picking up uh, plus 3 to the maximum cast level of the spells while in that stance. 45 extra spell power and 8% crit chance. It's worth it to make sure you're in the right season when you're casting spells. However, later on, I think there might be some argument to playing only one of the two types of druid, whether fire or water, especially considering that Ice Flowers, a very powerful hybrid force and water spell, uh, is very, very strong. So just keep that in mind. The rest of my points I spent in the Nature's Protector tree. I spent 11 here because the first three cores gives you access to heavy armor proficiency, which means you can wear heavy armor all the time. Uh, this is great because druids have no issues with the actual arcane spell failure. You just need to make sure you're wearing heavy armor that is not made of metal. Druids, unfortunately, can't wear metal items. Uh, you can if you go all the way up here into this bear tree. So while you're in bear form, you don't break your druidic oath. Uh, oath. Actually, I don't think it even requires bear form. But that's a really bad idea for a spellcaster druid because you want all this good stuff. So instead, 11 points. Get yourself some dragon scale heavy armor if you happen to have some kicking around. Do the quests like black and blue and newcomers to get some of the dragon scale armor. Uh, a lot of that stuff is pretty good. Or, in fact, there's some snow armor that you can get out of the new Feywild pack that can work well with this as well. 
And then on top of that, Nature's Defense giving you physical magic resistance rating, bonus to saves, and each core gives you a bunch of extra hit points, so your character becomes much tankier from just these 11 points. The rest of my points went into Fade Dark Illusionist. I did this for a couple reasons. Number one, you get to pick up a lot of wisdom here, so it's four extra points of wisdom. And unfortunately, the Season's Herald Capstone, the Hierophant, uh, only gives plus two wisdom and plus one to DCs. Uh, one of the things that Druid kind of suffers with during the leveling process is that there's very few places to get actual DCs, and you need Evocation and Transmutation to make all your spells work. So as a result, you're kind of behind, so getting extra wisdom from somewhere just to bump up all your DCs is pretty good from Fade Dark Illusionist. That and also the core, while you have your familiar summoned, you get 5 force and 5 universal spell power for each core ability you have. So by spending 24 points, you get 40 force spell power and 20 universal, plus all the other stuff, which is pretty good. Granting you extra 100 spell points, plus 3 to all saves. Blur, which you don't get access to as a druid, so it's not too bad. Uh, Magic Missile Protection, you don't get access to this as a druid, so it's not too bad. And then the force universal force spell critical chance here which is pretty good. Uh, this 1% universal spell critical chance might not seem that good, but you cast so many different spells. Lightning spells, acid spells, cold spells, um, fire spells. So having all of that crit chance is pretty nice, and then the force is even better. Same thing with Magical Attunement here. If I had more points, and basically I wasn't taking these points here in the Enhancement Tree, I would be spending them here on Magical Attunement. So uh, that being said, let's take a look at some of the equipment that I had. And I did not have a lot of really good stuff. I just picked this up at a shard, the Firestorm Conduit, which is not too bad. Granting fire and lightning lore and spell power, plus conjuration and evocation focus. Generally considered for a uh, non-druid type character, like a like a sorcerer or wizard with the arcane augmentation, which increases the cast level, but I don't really care about that. It gave me a lot of DCs, which was pretty nice. On that, I got this snow scale out of uh, <laughs> Feywild, so I'm level 20 with level 5 piece of armor on. That's just what happens when you pick up your own gear along the way. Uh, the Scarlet Scale Cloak I got, which was nice because it gives insightful evocation focus from Ravenloft, which was pretty cool. I was lucky enough to have someone pass me the Thrumming Spark Cord, which gave me Magnetism and Glaciation on a belt. Uh, this belt is actually really, really good, especially for Heroics. Uh, a lot of people are consider the fact that it doesn't stack means it's not that great. But you have to rem remember, this essentially clears up two of your spell casts, or like your spell types on here. And as a Druid, they're very hard to come by because you need so many. You need Fire and Lightning and Cold and Acid and everything else. Thorming Spark Cord, Burn Scar Sash, very good on Druid, especially for the leveling and heroic process because it just saves up that much on your uh, actual spell casting. So it saves up so you can you know not have to use those types of items because you also need Force Spell Power and Healing Spell Power. So I had like Devotion Gloves so I could get actual healing power. Impulse 74 Constitution 5 ring. This was a great pull. I'm very happy I got this. And then I'm using a Wisdom 5 helmet. I had a Wisdom 4, and then I got a Wisdom 5, and that's kind of where I ended here. So if you wonder why my Wisdom doesn't feel that high, that's pretty much why. This character does not have the best gear on it, but that's okay. This will manage to get through the game for the most part just fine. We played everything on pretty much exclusively Reaper mode. Ended with 34,000 Reaper XP, which is pretty good. Uh, but while it was... Uh, not the worst character. It definitely runs into a few problems. Obviously, things that hit it pretty hard are things with evasion. Uh, this character has a lot of reflex saves based into its spells and not a lot of things that bypass, which can get kind of annoying, especially when those monsters happen to be neutral. Uh, Sharn is a weird example where a lot of the monsters that you fight, like the humans, if they're not part of the Boromar clan, but they're one of Vaunt's mercenaries, uh, they're actually neutral for some reason. They're not classified as evil. Maybe it's because they're just getting paid. I'm not entirely sure. But as a result, your important spells like uh, Word of Balance, which is where you instantly kill monsters, uh, doesn't work on them. So you have to deal with that. But oh, also all of Vaunt's mercenaries all happen to have evasion. So this character had a really tough time dealing with Sharn, uh, more so than any of my other characters that I played. The other ones had a reasonable time in Sharn, but this character just struggled a lot to get through it. Fortunately, I had other people with me. And then when you have that happen, that's where Druid really starts to shine, being able to just support people by healing them, throwing out some easy crowd control, that sort of thing, and a lot of small incremental damage. Something like Ice Storm is not going to be doing enough damage to actually qualify as like killing all the monsters, but it adds a little bit of damage to everything and starts softening stuff up. Also getting just some uh you know last hits knocking monsters out of the way so if something has a sliver it gets taken out it's not too bad now if you're to take this character all the way up which i'm not going to do um i might be hiding it pretty well here but uh in likely the intro that you watched before this and also if you watch the live stream uh, i really despise druid as a spellcaster i don't like it that much there's just something about it that rubs me the wrong way um so i'm excited to reincarnate out of it but if you don't want to do that and you want to keep going with it you might think to yourself that primal avatar is the tree to go with uh, in the cores it gives you a bunch of universal spell power which is kind of cool um it gives you extra mana per primal avatar level it gives you evocation and transmutation dcs that all sounds really good so you would want to play in here and the answer to that 
is that you actually wouldn't want to play in here. Primal Avatar looks like it should be good for the Druids, but it kind of isn't. On the first row, you get a bunch of spells that don't do anything. You get Rejuvenation Cocoon, which is great, but you can twist it. Then you get this Insidious Spores effect, which does Rust and Poison damage, um, but it doesn't scale off of spell power. So this is terrible and doesn't do anything. Then you get a bunch of defensive abilities that don't do anything. Uh, then you get Tsunami, which is crazy strong because it knocks down monsters without a save. Uh, but you can, again, you can twist this. Summer Smoke, which is a very rare chance to proc and affect you and your party members, but doesn't do anything directly. A bunch of melee stuff. This... Autumn Harvest, which has a chance to heal people when monsters die, which is really weird. Storm Rage, which doesn't work on spells. Summoning a Dryad Elder, which is a spell you can already cast, because you're a druid. Um, Spirit Boon, which gives you plus two to your scores, which is okay. Chill of Winter, which is actually pretty useful. If anybody in your party has this, then uh, it makes it so that way, like, if a boss hits somebody, they uh, get slowed. But it's not really damaging stuff. And then this Tree Form, which d uh, doesn't let you cast spells while you're inside of it. So... Uh, it's pretty bad for Druid, and it's pretty bad for Spellcasters, so I do not I do not recommend this tree. The tree I recommend instead is this one, Magister. Now, why Magister? Here's the thing. Uh, number one, you want all of these abilities here. You might say to yourself, but I don't get cash levels. I don't get any wisdom. Why would I want this? Uh, you don't need the cash levels. You get a bunch of free cash levels from being in your actual elemental forms, and that's the key thing. So what you want instead is you want uh, additional spell points. You get more spell points out of this tree. And on top of that, DCs. Each core gives you plus one to all DCs. So you get six extra DCs here. Now you might say, okay, but if I was playing in Primal Avatar, I get one, two, and three extra Evocation of Transmutation DCs and six points of wisdom. That's kind of like having plus six to all DCs, except the better part of Magister is then you can start taking the Spell School Specialist. Very specifically in here, I can't click it for some reason, but you can get the augmentation, which makes it so that when you cast spells on monsters, it reduces their saves. Specifically, you can get the Evocation or Transmutation debuff that makes it when you hit monsters with spells, it reduces their saving throw, so you can make it even easier to hit spells against them. You can reduce the cooldowns of your spells, so if you wanted to be as a Fire Druid, you can reduce the cooldown of your Firestorm, which is pretty cool. And then extra cash levels and even higher DCs, getting more DCs than you ever could imagine. On top of that, you get another AoE spell in Arcane Tempest, which happens to be a Force spell, which if you cast it in the uh, Summer Stance, so while you're in the Fire Elemental form, it gets even more bonus caster levels on top of it and even more damage, and that synergizes very well with all the Force crit you get to pick up out of the Fey Dark Illusions tree and your little uh, familiar here that I happen to be circling around, which is hiding right behind my head. So that's what I recommend is Magister. The other destiny that you could also consider would be Exalted Angel. Because Exalted Angel gets plus three to all DCs and a bunch of wisdom, you could also pick up some things like extra spell points, uh, Avenging Light for the Radiant damage, because you do get some Radiant damage, as well as Reborn in the Light, the ability to resurrect yourself, or Sunbolt. Again, this isn't actually an entirely bad option either. It's just not generally what I would do over Magister, which is where I would go with this character. So it really depends. But I would go with Magister for sure when given the option. Anyways, that's pretty much all I have to say about uh, Spellcaster Druid. Uh, I don't like Spellcaster Druid, and I hope that this is the last time I play Spellcaster Druid for the next five years, unless something major changes. If you really like Spellcaster Druid, uh, the changes are good for you. They have only buffed the spells and made them more potent, and I think that you'll have a good experience generally playing around with some of the abilities and then new stuff that you can do, just like stuff being stronger. But if you wanted to understand really why I hate Spellcaster Druid, because you're not sure why what I found was weird and off about it, maybe you didn't pick that up from this video, maybe you should check out this the stream at twitch.tv slash streamtom, which is going to show up on screen right now. So that way you can check out all of the super fun uh, and exciting content that we do on the regular, where I basically just complain constantly and then people watch. And somehow I get paid for doing it. What an idea. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. I am about to go break my druidic oath, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.